Good morning, friends. I, I typically, uh, when I preach outside of DC, I typically say it's good to be among normal people, but I'm not sure I've sufficiently driven far enough away to warrant that today. It's good to see, especially some of you who are old friends. The first time I preached for this church, I think you were in rented facilities, and today you have this lovely building. Uh, the first time I think I preached for you all, I was less dependent on these things, and some of you were a little less gray. Michael Griffin? The first time I preached, I think I preached on hell, if I remember correctly, and today I'm preaching on parenting, which for some of you may not be much of a distinction between the two, which brings us to the sermon. And I trust uh, as we walk through this sermon and this passage that the Lord will bring clarity to your mind and Lord willing to that of your children. So let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would remove all the distractions that seem to creep or rumble through our minds, the worries, the anxieties, the schedule, the pressing matters, the busyness of the modern life. We pray, O oh God, as we look to your ancient word that it would shape us and form us, that our homes might better reflect all the good that you have for us, that our children might better reflect all the desires and for imaging you properly that you have for them, that we as parents might be more faithful in your sight. So help us as we look to your word now. Help us, O oh God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, when I utter the word authority, do you embrace it or do you kind of recoil? Is authority a good word or a bad word in your mind? And I'm talking about decisive authority, that which actually you listen to and obey. Is it an external thing held and imposed from the outside? Or is it an internal thing, something one feels from within? So Carl Truman, in his new book, Strange New World, explores 200 years of history's so-called greatest thinkers to see how we arrived at our day, our age, where man's inner life itself becomes the source of all truth, all authority. Truman writes this, the modern self finds himself in the midst of what has been called expressive individualism, where each of us seeks to give expression to our individual inner lives rather than seeing ourselves as embedded in communities and bound by natural and supernatural laws, authenticity to inner feelings, rather than adherence to transcendent truths, becomes the norm. He argues that uh, throughout the book that decisive authority that is now our inner feelings. It goes so far as even to determining one's gender. Do I feel like a man or a woman, or neither or both? It totally depends on how I feel. Inward psychological conviction is the non-negotiable reality to which all external realities must be made to confirm. If this is true, then I think Mike Law Jr. asking a guest preacher to speak on Exodus 20:12 honor your father and mother is a little outdated. Uh, if that idea wasn't shot through by the 1960s, it was, it was pretty well worn out. I mean, that generation, some of you will remember because you lived through it, they we, they, we drove Volkswagen Beetles, those old Volkswagen Beetles with question authority on the back of them, and, and they boycotted the Vietnam War uh, they abandoned the church. They bagged the institution of marriage for free love. I remember, I'm, I'm a baby boomer. But by God's grace, I'm standing here as a redeemed boomer. One who has the, who is the gracious recipient of God's electing love while I was in college. And I want to tell you that the, uh, of the opposite of what the world's telling you now. Do not look to the world for an operational definition of 
authority. The Ten Commandments were not handed down by God merely to function as the Ten Suggestions. They were handed to the people of Israel so that they might become the very image of God on the earth. And so this morning, as we look at the second table of the law, the, the first table consisting of the first four commandments, they were all vertical obligations, obligations that you had toward God. The second table consisting of the remaining six commandments are all horizontal commandments, those relating to each other. So this sermon is, should be profitable for everyone who has ears to hear. Uh, Sometimes preachers unusually use unusually necessary or unnecessarily usual, unnecessarily heavy, long words. And, and I understand that. I get it. So I'm going to stop periodically and I'm going to especially address kids or those of you who are students to, to kind of draw a point out. So uh, here's, here's everything of what I've said. If you haven't followed what I've said, kids, students, here's what I'm trying to say. Should I obey my inside feelings or something or someone outside of me? That's the question I'm trying to answer. And we're going to go to Exodus 20, verse 12, and you'll find that on page 61 of your pew Bible. It's a short verse, and here it is. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So my goal in the next few minutes is to answer the what, the who, the when, and the why. There's your outline. The what, the who, the when, and the why of what this commandment is trying to get at. First, the what. What does it mean to honor your father and your mother? If the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, is the foundation of the first four commandments, then you could equally argue that the fifth commandment, this commandment we just read, is the foundation of all the other commandments that follow. Why? Well, Jesus himself summarized for us these commandments in Matthew 22 when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where do you first lear, learn to love your neighbor? Uh, I would argue that it's the family. The family is the first and primary incubator from which all neighbor love flows. It shapes all other relationships. So when you come across a kind, considerate, kind of self-controlled little boy, do you think he learned that on the Disney Channel? How about a young girl who's respectful, other-centered, and quick to obey? Did she picked that up on TikTok, scrolling through? I don't think so. Behind these children, I think, are faithful parents who are training their children. It's true good parents can have children that go rogue, and miraculously bad parents can have good kids. But generally speaking, that's not how the world works. From the beginning, God had set it up for parents to be a good authority in their children's lives and for their children to obey and profit from such authority. So just a few months ago, I was teaching a Sunday school class where I said there are two broad stages to a children's life, a child's life. It's zero to five, training them to be under authority. Broad definition, zero to five, training them to be under authority, and six to 12, helping them to grow in God's character, in his likeness. Well, if you fail to teach a child to be under authority, all bets are off on trying to teach him character lessons when he's a little older. And brace yourself for what happens when the child leaves the home, when he steps outside of your home. Augustine said, if anyone fails to obey his parents, is there anyone he will spare? That's a good question. The home, the family, is where we first learn to live with other people. We are introduced to the very, very idea of authority, respect, honor. Our family is our first hospital, our first school, our first government, our first worship place. It 
It's where we are nurtured and instructed and where we are governed and where we learn to worship rightly. A good home is doing these things, subtly, quietly, different from day to day, but nonetheless doing these things. Okay, the word honor comes from the uh, Hebrew word kaved, K-A-V-E-D. It literally means heavy or weighty. It is the Old Testament word for the glory of God. It, it's the weightiness and divine majesty of God. To honor one's parents then is to give due weight to their position, to give them recognition they deserve for their God-given authority. So kids, students, I'm going to address you here. To honor your parents is to respect, value, and prize your father and your mother as gifts from God. That's what it means. The opposite is to dishonor them or disrespect them, or in other words, to use this word kavet again, to treat them lightly, kind of disregarding them. And the Old Testament had a way of dealing with such offspring who treated their parents dishonorably. These are hard sayings, but it does give you an idea of how much the Lord values or weighs this idea of honoring your parents. Listen to Leviticus 29. There's several verses I could give you. I'm just going to give you one. For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put on time out. For anyone who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood is upon him. There are other verses I could quote, Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. But I praise the Lord, we are in the New Testament. We are New Testament Christians. We are in a, under a new covenant. I share this verse just to show the seriousness of this commandment. This was quite literally life and death, whether or not you obeyed God's fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother. But even in the New Testament, the issue is still very much alive. Paul in 2 Timothy says there are days coming. Listen to this. He calls them the last days where things will get very difficult. He writes, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, with self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I, did you hear that? That disobedient to their parents is listed as one of the signs of the last days. I, this is important. Children need to know this. Parents need to know this. Simply put, a child must be taught and come to recognize that a father and mother have been placed over them by God himself, and therefore they owe reverence, obedience, and gratefulness. Therefore, it makes no difference whether the parent is always worthy of honor, for it is God who has put them there. It doesn't say only honor the good fathers and mothers. It doesn't say, only honor those who give, give you what you want. The title of father and mother is deemed weighty in God's eyes. It is an office of great significance, whether the world sees it or not. And I dare say we increasingly don't see it. I have a little thing where I just watch to see what happens on Father's Day and the various secular papers and how they treat fathers. They just, they almost know, don't know what to do with fathers. They, they seem optional at best. But that's, a, that's, a, that's the world speaking. So kids, students, th this word's for you. In God's loving providence, your parents gave you life. That fact alone is sufficient to warrant your honoring them. Okay, number two, who? Who is this command aimed at? Well, it's children, right? Uh, children, I'm going to talk to you again for a moment here. God has placed your father and or your mother 
in your life, especially for you. You should assume they know more and better about what's good for you. And if you feel this is hard, remember even Jesus, the one who never sinned, who upholds all things by his word, he too was submissive to his parents. Do you see, the, the second person of the Trinity, the God had put himself under his earthly parents and honored them. Now, as you get older, you should change. Your, your relationship with your parents is going to change. As you give evidence of maturity and strong character, you should also be given more responsibility and more independence. But that doesn't change the command for you to honor your mom and dad. Teenagers, it seems a rite of passage in our culture that you are expected to rebel, to push back against your parents. And you feel it, don't you? You feel like your parents sometimes don't get you. They're too strict. They have too many rules. Nonetheless, you teenagers, this commandment is for you. Do you honor your parents with your speech? When the other kids at school are talking, whether it be at the lunch table or in class, in the locker room, on the playing field, wherever it may be, when they're talking badly about, your par about their parents, what are you saying about yours? They don't understand. They're always on my back. Do you, do you treat your parents lightly? I think, I think before God, that is a mistake, if not sin. If you really want to be a rebel, why don't you try to rebel and get, go against the world that dismisses their parents? Now, that would be great rebellion in God's sight. And instead, honor your mom and your dad. Parents, your turn. Right after Paul tells the children in Ephesians 6 to give honor, what's he say? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We dads, we tend to fall off the horse on one side or the other. We're either too heavy-handed, too harsh, or too passive. Deuteronomy 6, you, you probably know this verse. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Dads, moms, I understand. I've got five kids and now nine grandchildren. Just when I think I kind of get better as a person, then those little grandchildren came in and just started provoking me again. I, I'm not sure I changed or grew at all. I just lost opportunity. The three-year-olds can just kind of, wow, okay, why is my heart suddenly, okay, I can go on, but you can talk to Eli about it. She's a better parent than I am and better grandparent. Um, we, we don't want to provoke our children. We want to teach them. That's what Deuteronomy 6 is saying. Give godly instructions. Show your children the Lord. Sadly, some parents are outright abusive. And they provoke their children to anger. And they bring on the rebellion. Some of us are more subtle. We parents, we can replace God's word, word with our word. God's word with our preferences. We can try to exercise our authority perhaps a little too long. In this day and age of helicopter parenting, I'd like to encourage you to think of parenting more as a long walk. In those early years, you, you should be out front of your children, kind of leading the way, right? But by high school, college, those early years after college, you should be pulling a long parent alongside of them so that they might see you more as coach, counselor, friend, fellow journeyman. And then when they are independent and supporting themselves, you should be behind them, ready to offer support, but cheering them all the way, knowing how to kind of relationally kind of downshift is important. 
know where you are in your children's lives. And it'll be, it's a bit of a challenge when you've got older children and, and still have little ones. You have to exercise a kind of authority at home with your little ones that your older ones don't quite need. But that distinction is fine and it's a necessary distinction. I would encourage you to think more about it. Okay, back to Exodus 2012. Notice there's no age limit here. It's not only for small children or while children live at home. How sure am I? Matthew 15, Jesus is talking no less to the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. He says, he asks them, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. He's saying this not only to adults, but to the leaders, the religious leaders of their day. These Pharisees and scribes, what were they doing? They weren't taking care of their parents, their, the elderly ones. They, these, the religious people were saying, we gave everything to temple that we had to spare. They're on their own. And God's saying, you're ignoring my law. This means that Jesus sees the care of parents, even in their old age, as a prime example of honoring them. It's insufficient to stick mom in the old folks' home and forget about her. Okay? So let's get this straight. I have to honor my parents when I live under their roof, when I've left home, when I'm an adult and they're old, and how about after they've died? I think our posture should, even after they've died, posture should be one of honor. Now, it doesn't mean you don't recognize your parents' failings. And it doesn't mean you're not honest and open about the pains and hurts that exist. And it doesn't mean you don't laugh with them about their foibles. Be kind to those of us who kind of reluctantly came into the digital age. It's been a nightmare. My children have been very gracious to me. But work to not despise them, not mock them. Work to look up, not down, to your older parents. Okay, number three, when? When? Are there limits to honoring your father and your mother? I think there's at least two scenarios that are going to be difficult to honor your parents. The first is when your parents put pressure on you not to honor the Lord. Even parents who know and love the Lord have been known to, to try to persuade their kids from following him. I mean, the most obvious one is when a, a son or a daughter comes and says, Mom, Dad, I feel the Lord calling me to overseas missions work. And the parents kind of lose their minds. They're like, they can't imagine life without seeing their kid and their grandkids. And they start pushing, putting pressure on them and pushing back on them. Well, then there's unconverted parents who, by nature, to use a biblical term, are blind. They do not understand the way of the cross, and which is often a path of sacrifice. Uh, sac of sacrifice. Their, their values are literally upside down from yours as a Christian. So what do you do in the case of these believing and unbelieving parents? Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So we do have a loyalty and allegiance that's even higher than that of our parents, our earthly parents. I have a dear friend who's a church planter born and raised in North India. He was shunned by his family. Why? Because he would not submit to his father's request to physically stay near the family under his father's authority. Mind you, my friend is 40 years old. But that Asian culture is still calling on him, putting pressure on him to kind of disobey the Lord in order to honor his father. When Jesus said, go into the world, my friend took that seriously, even at the risk of losing his family, which he in large part has. The second scenario is when, when you have parents who simply are just undeserving. Uh, the Bible uh, does instruct us to honor our parents, but it does not command us to stay in harm's way. In a room this size, 
Uh, it is no stretch of the imagination to think that some of you came from homes that look like less like Leave it to Beaver and the Brady Bunch, where these TV moms and dads could solve every kid's problems in 30 minutes. <laughs> they, I, I've known a young woman for now 15 years who was given up for adoption at age eight. And the reason why is because her father was serving uh, a long deserved jail sentence. And her mother died having subjected her body to unmentionable things. As a young girl, she saw things that no child should ever have seen. How is this young woman to speak of her parents? This may be the scenario for some of you. Some of you have been verbally, perhaps mentally abused, and some still have the tender scars from physical abuse. If no one's ever said it to you, I want to say I'm so sorry. What you suffered goes against all nature and certainly God's command and know that he will judge it. I understand the instinctive natural reaction of saying they don't deserve to be honored. Is this possible? Can I really honor an undeserving parent? Uh, we're going to look at scripture. We know from the book of Samuel that King Saul would not win any father of the year contests. He ordered his soldiers, including his own son, Jonathan, to kill the future King David, an innocent man who is a dear friend of Jonathan. This put Jonathan in a bad situation, to say the least. He's supposed to honor his father, who also happens to be the king who could kill him. All the while knowing murder is against God's law. Jonathan did the right thing. He actually honored God by disobeying his father. He warns David, and then he intercedes with his father to swear off this sin. He did not dishonor his father, but worked to preserve the king's honor. Jonathan, he was not blind to the king's fault, to the, his father's own faults, yet he still honored him. And the last we see from him is at his father's side fighting to preserve his life against the Philistines where he died in a field. How can you honor the dishonorable parent? If you can do nothing else, take advice from Proverbs eleven twelve: 12. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. When my own parents were still alive, I asked one of my brothers, I'm one of seven sons, I, I said, how am I supposed to honor mom and dad? And he said, Matt, choose to live an honorable life. There was wisdom there. My brother knew an honorable life reflects well on others, including my parents, merely by association. But friends, the only way this is possible is through Christ's strength. You will not do this on your own. You cannot gut this one out in the flesh. We in our own strength are too weak. We are too sinful to live up to any of God's commands. The only hope we have is dying to ourselves and being born again. What's that mean? Repenting renouncing our sin and turning to Jesus who bore our sins on a deadly cross as our substitute, receiving the punishment for the sins that we deserved. He grants new life. He offers living water and the strength to live out commandments like honor your father and mother. Number four, why? Why is it being asked, why should we honor our parents? 
I think there's several reasons. One, parents deserve it for the many sacrifices they make on behalf of their children. They've earned it. Two, parents have a wealth of knowledge. Kids, you may not think your parents know all that much, but they probably know more than you realize. You've heard Mark Twain's quote, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to be, have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Here's another reason. God designed it this way. God has made us to live in families where parents have the role of teaching and guiding and disciplining. One of my adult children who's married and has several children spent a weekend with another couple and a, a little girl. And uh, she told us that, that the couple never once in the entire weekend instructed their child or commanded or did anything of the child. It was all options all the time. I, did, I didn't think it possible. I said, Tell me, give me an example. She said, she said they literally would do this. Do you want eggs or oatmeal for breakfast? Do you want to play inside or outside? Do you want to walk or be in the stroller? Do you want red or blue pajamas? Do you want to go to bed in 10 minutes or 20 minutes? My daughter said it just became absurd. Who was the leader in that home? The child was in charge, right? Parents are just making offerings, like a menu. What do you want? You're in charge. God has designed families to work where parents lead and children follow. It's his design. Parents, you are God's ambassadors, agents, representatives to the family. Children happily living under the rule of their parents is the beginning of them learning to live under the rule of God. I really want to repeat that again because I think it's super important. Children happily living under the rule of their parents are learning how to happily live under the rule of God. Kids, students, here's a great reason to honor your parents. There's a promise attached to this commandment. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, God was not promising a long life here. The phrase actually is referring to an abundant life. God is saying, if you want to enjoy my full blessings in this life, you'll listen to your mom and dad. God could have ended this with a threat, right? But he doesn't. He ends it with a promise. He's, it's like he's saying this to the children of Israel. Your parents saw my great works. I turned the Nile into blood. I brought nasty plagues on Egypt. I delivered your parents out of Pharaoh's hands, threw a sea on dry land, brought water out of a rock. And now... And now you are on the cusp of the land that I promised to give you. Listen to the stories of your parents. Listen to them. Be a people under authority and you will know my blessing. Now, some of you kids have been well taught and might be saying, these are words were spoken in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. We are Christ Church under the New Covenant. Excellent point. But in God's wisdom, though, he had the Apostle Paul say it again in the New Testament, not once, but twice. Ephesians 6, 1 to 2, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Colossians 3, 20, children, obey your parents in the Lord in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Kids, keep listening to what I'm going to tell your parents now, okay? Parents. What ultimately happens to the recipients of these Ten Commandments and to their children and to their children's children? We read in Judges 2.10, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. They did not know the Lord. They did not even know what God had done for Israel, the great deliverer and his spectacular deliverance wasn't even spoken of? How is this possible?
to see what they had seen and not tell their children. They apparently didn't bother to open their mouths. What is it said about generational wealth can be said about faith. The first generation earns it, or in our case, believes it. The second generation assumes it, and the third generation loses it. Parents, you're instructed to teach your children about God, his offer of salvation through Christ, and all of his promises. Can I just say a quick word to you grandparents? Um, your job's not done. You've done your job with your kids, I trust well, but your job as a grandparent's not done. Maybe in our modern age, we shuffle grandparents off to the side. But when this was written, grandparents were very much in the home and instructed the, the little ones. Don't just be the grandparent who shows up with gifts and cookies. Your, your grandchildren have plenty of sources of, for sugar. They don't have enough sources for the gospel, right? Get a vision for how you can be involved in your grandchildren's lives and take advantage of the opportunity to gospel them. I took a trip recently where I got home very late. The house was dark. Eli was already asleep. I woke up the next morning late and sensed something was different in the home, like something was going on. As it turns out, she decided to have a sleepover with the four local grandchildren, and I didn't know about it. And so when I made my way downstairs, I looked down into the living room, and there she was reading the children's Bible to all four. One was at her knee, two were on her shoulders, and one was on her lap. And I thought, there's a woman who has a vision for her grandchildren love them enough to share the gospel with them and preach to them. They know what they're going to get when they show up at Grammy's house. They'll get, they'll get plenty of Oreos, no doubt, but, but they'll also get the gospel. I was very proud of you. Set your mind, parents, set your mind and heart now to be that of Psalmist 78. I will open my mouth in a parable. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Oh, I pray that's every parent's heart and grandparent's heart in this room today. All right. You must teach, but you can't just teach. You have to show. There are, there are two parts to this. You have to show and tell. What do I mean? Children won't always listen to their parents, but they will rarely fail to imitate them. So make yourself, parents, worthy of imitation. Listen to these verses. Fill in the missing word for me. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, so that would be every believer in this room. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to this, to the what? To the image of his son. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same what? Image from one degree of glory to another. What does God call fathers and mothers to do? But not just moms and dads, but the whole church. We are to display, to reflect the character and likeness and image of our Father in heaven like a mirror does toward the sun. All of us, all of us have fallen short. We look like one of those bendy carnival mirrors, if you've ever seen one. But it's not too late. The best parents get up the next morning and do it again and pray again and try to be faithful again. Do you know how many restarts we've had in our year, 35 years of parenting? The worst parents quit and don't keep trying. Our children are watching. Your heavenly father is a peacemaker, so moms, be peacemakers. Your heavenly father loves his enemies, so, so dads, love your enemies. Don't talk badly of them. 
Your heavenly father is holy. So church, be holy. These children are watching you. By doing this, we are presenting our children and the whole world with a series of portraits of God. Our kids look at at their mom and their dad in the church and they get a glimpse. They're supposed to get a taste of who God is as we grow in his character and likeness, imaging him in word and deed. Okay, kids, students, you get the last word. You always get homework at the end, right? Think hard. Think hard about how you're going to honor your mom and dad this week. I want you to get something in your head. What can you do to honor your mom and dad? I see the wheels spinning over here. That's good. What can you do, perhaps that you didn't do last week, that you can do this week, that would honor your parents. How about about just being thankful for something? How about just going up to mom or dad and say, thank you for something, fill in the blank. How about this one? How about saying, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, dad. How about when your parents ask you to do something, you say, yes, mom, or, Okay, Dad, trust me, your parents are going to love this. Next next week, when Pastor Mike's back, I want you to flood him with stories of how you honored your parents this week that was different than last week. He'll love that too. So Exodus 20.12 is not a suggestion, but a commandment, and it has a wonderful promise at the end. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God was giving to you. Let's pray. Father, your mercy even this morning, is new to us. You have been merciful by sharing your word with us. And we pray, O God, that we would not walk away quickly forgetting, but that you would sear all that was right into our minds and that we would know and do. Pray for every child here in this room that this might even mark the beginning of a change where authority is respected and loved and embraced and that each child knows good from it. And I pray for each parent in this room that he or she may be faithful in bringing God's word to these children in living out your word in front of them. That they be found faithful in your eyes. And we pray for every grandparent, every grandfather and grandmother in this room. That they would see as long as they have breath that God has a purpose for them in the lives of their children and grandchildren. That they can be a mighty encouragement with their tongues by bringing God's word to them. Let all this mark Arlington Baptist Church, that this church might image you more, and this community might see light in a way that they hadn't previously. We ask this, O God, for our good, and we ask this for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen.